This week, the much anticipated meeting between the Electoral Commission, uh, the Electoral Commission's eminent advisory committee and IPAC. Now, this much anticipated meeting between you know, these three um, stakeholders, if you like, came off on Thursday, the 30th of January, 2020, without any change in the positions of the parties concerned. Now, going into the meeting, the EC had fixed the 18th of April, 2020, as the date for the commencement of the voter registration exercise. So you can say that it was beyond obvious that the EC's position on its acquisition of a new biometric voter management system and indeed the compilation of a new voters register was not going to change. Now, similarly, those opposing this move by the EC were unwavering in their position. They went in with, what, um, with that entrenched position. Now, the meeting came to an inconclusive end with positions unchanged. Now, the way forward for the EC from what they have been saying appears to be clear, which is that they're going to commence the voters registration exercise on the 18th of J April, sorry, 2020. The way forward for the opponents, which is the <coughs> inter-party resistance against a new voters regis register, is however not too clear. Question is, are they going to continue with their demonstrations across the country as they have already served notice of saying? Or are they in the circumstances going to um, mobilize their supporters to participate in the voters registration exercise, which per the EC's calendar is to take off from the 18th of April 2020. These are some of the matters we shall be turning our attention to when we move on to look at the raging conversation about the compilation of the new voters register amidst the EC's decision to acquire a new biometric voter management system. Many other issues will come along the way. Now, these are the main topics for conversation this morning. We'll take a quick break. When we come back, I'll introduce to you the first set of panelists for today's conversation, which will start with a look at one year after the unfortunate incidents that came along with the Ayawa Sue West Wogan by elections. And we will be looking at what has happened one year after that. Have we learned any lessons, you know, from those incidents which led to the setting up of the Justice Emil Short Commission, who did some work in respect of some fact finding matters and put out a report. The report was subsequently um, responded to by the government in the form of a white paper, which among others, um, accepted some findings, uh, adopted some recommendations, but also rejected some findings and questioned some recommendations. Now, in the studio to have this conversation for now, we do have, um, from my extreme left, Dr. Ahmed Jinapo. He is the senior lecturer with the University of Education, Winneba. And to my immediate left, we do have most reverend Professor Emmanuel Asante. He is the chairman of the National Peace Council and also a member of the EC's eminent advisory committee. Good morning, gentlemen. Good it's, morning. it's great to, to have you here to look at um, this all important issue, particularly as we are in an election year and gradually inching closer and closer to um, the December polls. Before we delve into the conversation, let's just recap events that occurred on the 31st of January 2019. So we'll take a look at <coughs> some footage that, you know, where we, we put together from those events. So let's just take a, a look at that and come back to the panel. Just hours into the by-election, some armed men clothed in national security apparel stormed the La Balesha Presby polling station. Eyewitnesses see the armed men fire shots and attacked some agents believed to be from the opposition NDC. The men, according to eyewitnesses, also stormed the home of NDC candidate Lali Fukwesi Brimpong. A video footage also emerged depicting NDC Member of Parliament for Ningo Pram Pram, Samuel George, being heckled and attacked by masked men wielding guns. This action by the national security operatives was severely criticized, prompting the president to institute a commission of inquiry to investigate the matter. 
is totally inappropriate and unacceptable. It's not sufficient for us to just, for you to bring them and, and deposit it at the Secretariat. You must go and bring them and testify before us. Flag bearer of the National Democratic Congress and former President John Mahama, wading into the debate, maintained President Ekufodo failed to fully accept the recommendations of the Commission of Enquiry, adding that it was a mockery of the law. But addressing a news conference in Accra on Friday, Information Minister Kojo Ponkruma explained that state institutions will sooner than later make known the level of progress in the implementation of government's white paper. Government explained the parts of the report that it accepted, the parts of the report that uh, it disagreed with in accordance with our constitutional uh, provisions. And the various state agencies that are taxed with implementing parts of it uh, are going through their own processes of implementation. And this is customary with all um, government white papers. The parts that are disagreed with, you will not be seeing an implementation. The parts that were agreed with, the various state agencies that are responsible for implementing, them, whether it's the police or whether it's the Attorney General's Department or um, the National Security Secretariat or whatever, they will be the ones responsible for implementing and updating on where they are um, on that score. The event of January 31, 2019, an albatross on the neck of many who suffered injuries. The event many have said cast a slap on Ghana's democracy and a reflection of the 2020 elections. A year on, the scars are still fresh. While many lessons have been drawn from the dastardly act, questions have been raised about the decision of the police not to provide security for the commemoration of the NDC. I am totally shocked and disgusted by the conduct of our police service. And indeed, I like to use this opportunity to send a very clear and loud warning to our security services. No security force can stand against the will and determination of the people. And that ultimately, the people of this country will take their destiny into their own hands and they will defeat all the negative forces which intend to cause chaos and mayhem in our country. And I can assure them of that. Which po professional police officer will send a message like this? It shows the bastardization of the institutions of state that have taken place under this NPP administration. Of course, NDC is coming. We will reform the police service. While the police denied the NDC security of the anniversary, the police heavily secured the Baalishi school park grounds ostensibly to provide security for the MPP MP Lydia Al Hassan, who was marking the event. Former President John Mahama says for the government to ignore the short commission's recommendation is an embarrassment. Okay, so that was some footage from uh, 31st January 2019 to uh, 31st January 2020 uh, where uh, there was that commemoration one year after those events of 31st January 2019. Um, so the events, you know, that we had caused to complain of occurred on the 31st of January 2019 during the by-elections <coughs> being that was being organized by the Electoral Commission in the Ayawaso West Wogan constituency. Then <coughs> Within a week of that e those events, uh, the president set up the commission of inquiry led by or headed by um, Justice Emil Schott on the 8th of February 2019. The commission sat to and took um, evidence or testimony from a wide range of persons from the 14th of February 2019 through to the 8th of March 2019 and then subsequently on the 14th. 14th of March 2019, uh, the Commission submitted its report to the President and the President or the government also um, issued a white paper six months thereafter in September 2019. 
And today's conversation essentially will be, you know, we'll, we'll walk down memory lane, see the events that happened there. And of course, we're going to be looking at the report as put out by the commission and the government's response uh, being the white paper that government issued. Um, once again, thank you so much, Prof and Doc. Um, most Rev, <laughs> I usually tend to use Prof, but I think the most appropriate would be Most Rev. And um, Dr. Ahmed Janapo, thanks for joining me here. I will start with you, Most Reverend. Um, you, we, you saw the playback of events to yes, the sir. point where there was a one year commemoration and all. Now, I just want us to go back to the Commission's report mm -hmm. where it states at page six, and I'm going there just so we can start the conversation from the perspective that the Commission had when it set out to, you know. To, to do its work. It says that it is hoped that given the collective stake that all Ghanaians share in the security of the country, this report would shed some light on dark areas of Ghana's democracy. Mm. And obviously after those um, dark areas are brought to the fore, the ultimate thing would be to see how best we can resolve those. Now question is, <coughs> Did the report of the commission, and indeed their televised you know, hearings and sittings, shed some light on dark areas of Ghana's democracy? Thank you very much. I, I like to think that it did, mm. um, in the sense that we um, were made to see how bankrupt we are mm. in terms of the democracy that we seem to be um, propagating. Um, and, and so, because of that, some steps have been taken, but I, we're not going there mm. yet. But I think that, you know, as we all listen to the various representation before the Commission of Inquiry, uh, we saw that I was asking myself, why should we even be talking about this after so many years of practicing democracy? in the country. But then it tells you that we are still um, struggling with the concept of democracy, living and letting others right. live, and so on. So <coughs> I'm very sure that you know the findings of the commission might have informed the Act 999, which we'll be yeah. talking about. Sure. It somehow also um, I wouldn't say that it directly informed what the NPC and the dialogue did, but I don't think that we also did what we did oblivious of the findings and of the things that we had as a result of the Commission of Inquiry. Right. So as far as I'm concerned, um, it threw light on the activities and on the menace of what I would want to, I want to use the word political attackery. Right. You know, I mean, the, the, the f how it showed us how we should not entertain mm. anything of this nature right. in our democracy. Right. You do talk about Act 999, which I, the, the Vigilantism and Other Related um, Offenses, Offenses Act. Act, as coming out as, you know, if you like, an offshoot of what happened, mm. um, 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 transpired you know, with, yes. with the sittings and all of that. Uh, so that showing that, yes, we're trying to address certain aspects of it. But yes. do you think, you know, overall, we have demonstrated a certain desire to actually deal with these issues that the commission terms to be, you know, the dark areas of our, of our democracy? Well, you know, I mean, the main, the, the, let's, uh, so long as we are, we've attempted to address you know, vigilante and related offenses, and we've come up with an act to address that, one would say, in a sense, we, we have made a move. Mm. Um, I can also tell you um, that as a result of this, what you call unfortunate, and I would also say unfortunate mm. incident at work, I also work on something that was not really called for. But we must know that, I mean, by-elections have always been characterized sure. with these <coughs> kinds of things. To the extent that some people were even calling that we should, if it's possible, we should do away with by-elections. 
But whatever it is, it also has led to the dialogue between the two political parties. You know, um, and I can tell you that the dialogue has been going on. We met on five occasions, mm. April 9th. <laughs> 2019, April 29, April, you know, um, 27, 28, and uh, November 7th, five times. And of these five times that we have met, we produce communiques indicating commitment okay. um, to ensure that these things do not occur. On the 4th of, of February, there will be an event where we will meet to finalize the outcomes of the and a roadmap will be unveiled to try to ensure that we do things even though the act is there what do we do to make sure that the act is operationalized mm. that right. we do what is expected of us so right. somehow um, I would say that something good came out of it mm. yeah. very well now quickly to um, Doc you um, have also, obviously, you, you witnessed all that happened, and then subsequently uh, the commission's report came. Then there was uh, the government's white paper, which we've made reference to, you know, a portion um, right now on the show. I would also want us to make another reference to the reports, you know, just as we are trying to put matters in perspective in, in our, you know, introductory or preliminary uh, stages of the discussion. Where again, the reports at page six, paragraph three particularly states that it is the hope of the commission, right, that this report and its concomitant recommendations would mark a watershed in the management of Ghana's security and assist in designing systems for the future prevention of the incidents such as was witnessed in the Ayawaso West Wogan constituency. They're talking about a watershed, a period of, if you like, a turning point where we would see things in a certain way and then begin to reform. Do you think that governments in its response, i.e. the white paper and subsequent actions and or inactions, um, demonstrates that this turning point the commission hoped to achieve did come to pass? Well, uh, first of all, let me say good morning to your cherished viewers and listeners. And uh, let me say I'm privileged and honored to be sitting on the same platform with most reverend prof. Indeed. Uh, of course, uh, Mr. Bonner, we've, we've met before, I think, on the same platform. But uh, Abna, I would have, before I respond to your Question. But now that you mentioned yes. um, Mr. Bonner, let me <laughs> let me do the needle okay. and introduce him before I'm taking yet. your job. I know. <laughs> <laughs> right. So joining us on the set is um, Mr. Adam Bonner. He is a security analyst, and we are grateful for your time. Thanks for joining us. Right. Abba, before I respond to your question mm -hmm. regarding whether government has taken steps to address the concerns that have been raised in the report, I think uh, what you started with, uh, Most Reverend you made reference to page six yeah. of that report, where in that report, I think if I got you right, that it is our collective responsibility mm -hmm. as a country to ensure that these dark areas of our democracy yeah. do not repeat itself. And I believe that statement more or less summarizes everything that happened there. And we are speaking to this issue because just yesterday, or is it the day before yesterday, the NDC had a commemoration event, commemoration, to more or less look at what happened a year ago. When we talk about commemoration, you commemorate something because one, either that thing that happened was good and you want it to be remembered, or in the instance of the Ayawasu issue, it was something that using the NDC's uh, phrase, never again, never again. And I go back to the question that you asked, whether government has taken steps to what? To address the never again, never again. Because if you look at the report, I mean, you can say that the report condemned what happened. And I must say, the media needs to be commended 
for what they did because we started this discussion by looking at footage. Most Ghanaians sat in their rooms by their TV sets and really were able to be involved and attached to what happened because of what they were the the reporting. Yeah. So I think whether government has done anything regarding it, the Minister for Information answered it as part of the, the, the report that you gave. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Minister for Information did indicate what government has done, whether uh, something positive has been done or not. He said that something has been done. But my worry... But that's for us to assess. Yes. They would but, say... But yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, he's saying that the this. different agencies that are supposed to do A, B, right. C, D are working on it. But I'm gonna, I'll go back to the commemoration. Mm -hmm. And that, I believe, must be of concern to every Ghanaian in the sense that if you look at the commemoration that happened, it was a one-sided what? Activity. One-sided. Mm. Because we are saying never again. I listened to most uh, uh, reverend make reference to a number of dialogues that have taken place behind closed doors. But you can, you agree with me that the posture, the commentary, the words from both sides of the political aisle regarding this thing is one that does not mm reflects something, I mean, collaborative mm. going on behind closed doors. And when we listen to what happened, even to the extent that the police refused to provide security, when the police was an integral element within this whole theater, it tells you that there's nothing like reconciliation. Mm. There's there, there's no sign of reconciliation because this was a one-sided activity. And if you listen to the words that were used, it tells you that, look, the NDC as a party, and I would say those who were mostly affected, feel that, look, if this thing is going to happen again, then we are also going to what? Be prepared. I make reference to uh, Sam George. Sam George's statement. I mean, what he said there. You listen to Mr. Kwasi Pratt. I'm not saying what they said was wrong, but it doesn't give us assurance that this thing is not going to happen again. And I would have wished that this activity that was organized, even though well organized by the organizers, well attended, I would have wished that it should have been something national. Something national. We have the Peace Council there, the, the government representatives there, the, the NDC. And, so that we, the ordinary Ghanaians, will be given what? The assurance that something happening behind those closed doors yeah. is something that we, the people, should have confidence in. Not the, 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 the war drums mm. that are, being, mm. are still being, be, be, mm. being beat, beaten. Right. You know, I think it's unfortunate. Right. And uh, most times, I don't know, we, the ordinary Ghanaians or the ordinary voters, I don't know what we should think. Politicians behave differently behind closed doors, hmm. but when they come out, they behave differently. Hmm. And I don't think that annoys to the benefit of the ordinary voter. Right, right. I, I think, before I go to Mr. Bonner, let me come back to you, Mosh Reverend, here, because Mr. Um, Dr. Jean-Paul raises a very valid point here, which is, it appears there's this, you know, the NPC process which is going on, and according to your account, showing that, yes, there's some collaboration or some cooperation from both sides. Yet, we see statements like what we you know heard from Even including the former president yeah former from president exactly from the peace from, from from from, from, the, peace from the from the ndc at the commemorative event you know uh, was it on the 30th what does that i mean clearly that would give mixed signals yeah. and and that would be worrying if i were a mediator of parties like that seeing them appear to be you know cooperating on the one hand and then on the other there's this what does that what does that do to your process and how do you envisage that this would you know um um, um, um pan out ultimately uh, when everything is said and done well let me say this the <coughs> ideal and i use the word the ideal mm -hmm. would have been for the commemoration of such an event to be a national, national. thing that is the ideal. But this is something that you will never get in a country like ours where politicization of everything becomes issue. And especially in a 2020 
year, uh, year. 2020, <laughs> which is an election year right. in this country. I've listened to what is obtaining in the United States. You appeal to your constituencies <laughs> and you seize opportunity. We know in this country how politicians have used funerals, the death of their members or the little events, just to appeal to their constituencies and mm. let them know that we are here. You know, one would have thought that, as he rightly said, commemoration, and I'm speaking as a theologian here. Right. In the Bible, when you talk about commemorating something, you experience the past in the present in order not to sustain what happened then, to try to do something about it. So one would have thought that an event of that nature, together with other events, which has been a blot on our democracy, will be a matter of concern for the entire country. And institutions, mm. like, as you mentioned, the police, the Peace Council, the government, parliament, and all the others will be there for us to do serious reflection. Parliament has come up with an act. Mm. A dialogue is going on for us to inform Ghanaians that uh, Ayao Wasu Wogon, the mother of all those events, gave rise to this, and this is where we are now. But what happened? We exploited that situation, mm. and I'm using the word exploited the situation to, if you like, appeal to our constituencies. And that inflames passion instead of trying to draw people's attention to efforts that are being made right. to mitigate the, the whole thing. But that's an ideal situation. I mean, ideally, this is what is to be expected. But me, I'm not surprised that we are politicizing it. If you have followed the political history of this country, and I'm sure that Dr. Njenapo has done that, you would notice that Every little thing that should be a matter of all of us is politicized. One would have thought that we would come here today even to be discussing the, um, what do you call, the, the ambulances. You know, the ambulance that has come, the maintenance <laughs> regime and those kinds of things. But what are we talking about now? You know, so these are the sort of things that we, we think. But I, as, as he rightly said, these are not the things that will help us. Mm -hmm. I'd like to believe that we have coined something in Ghanaian politics, political talk. I have had, met politicians who have said, oh, that was a political talk. But I think we need to talk about security talk mm -hmm. and <laughs> things that would also facilitate right. um, peace in this, in this country. Right. If the police decided that they were not going to provide the kind of security that was needed mm -hmm. is very unfortunate. Exactly, which clearly yeah. goes back to the point about how, you know, that space really yes. works and yeah. whether or not we've learned lessons. And clearly, I mean, if indeed that is what happened, then we, we haven't learned our yeah. lessons then. Because but, but you see, as I'm saying, we, when matters of this nature happen, it is always important that the institutions concerned, we call them, mm. because we have heard from one side. Exactly, just to we do not put know it. exactly what led to what. Right. So I think it sure. is always important to hear that both we, sides. Yes, exactly. We do that. It always yeah. helps, um, yeah. Mr. Bona. A year after, we sat here and looked at the issues as the commission's work was going on. We had, you know, a number of sessions here. We discussed and everything. The report came out. Government's white papers come out. Some findings rejected, others accepted, recommendations accepted, some, you know, and all of that. One year after, how do you assess our um, steps at dealing with the issues that were uncovered from the work of the Commission? Yeah, <clears throat> good morning, and good morning to the most reverend professor. I've been on other programs with him and my other brother here. Yes, one year on the work of the Commission, superb. If you ask me, I would say the commission did uh, more than some of us uh, would have imagined. You realize uh, initially when the vice president uh, or the president through the nice. vice president, uh, you know, nominated or appointed the commissioners, 
to you know uh, superintend over this there were we we had a lot of you know conversation in the media uh, where uh, you know i think was it johnson i see you or somebody like that said they wouldn't uh, you know uh, cooperate with the, work, cooperate of the, commission. With the mm. work of the commission but eventually i think they softened their stand and so the rest is history we also how diligent uh, you know, the good old uh, Justice and Short and his team, you know, uh, did their work. Everything televised. Mm. He didn't want to do anything behind closed mm -hmm. doors, which to me was very important so that there won't be uh, anything like some of the things were hidden. And so for me, I would say I would pat the, you know, leadership, the executive in the back for instituting, you know, uh, such a commission. But the only thing I would say is, fast forward, we haven't learned anything, mm. and probably significantly so because I would also put the blame on the doorstep of the executive, i.e. the president and his handlers. Because when this issue happened, uh, one of the first, I mean, the first station I, that spoke to me uh, was your station. Uh, is it uh, the, your, your colleague who would host the morning show? I mm. uh, can't remember his name. He is called me. Is? I was in the office when he called me, mm. uh, you know. And my office is not too far away from the, where the action took the place. The epicenter. Yes, <laughs> uh, I mean. And so when he called, well, the call started coming from all the media houses, as usual. Once something happens, they start calling. So I was wondering what was going on. So I picked that of your station and they said, Mr. Bonner, can we go live on Skype? I said, what's going on? Then they started beaming mm. uh, the Epic Center where it was right. like a war zone. Where, you know, people getting beaten. I thought, whoa, what's going on there? And so what then happened was they said it was the police. I said it wasn't the police because the police, in terms of structure, wouldn't dare do such a thing. You, you know, eventually I was vindicated that it wasn't the police because then the police came in to say, we didn't do it. And uh, the uh, call them the commissioners did their work, put a report together, and what did we get the leadership, you know, i.e. the president and his handlers do? They said they deviated. And if I am your student, and you gave me a question to 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 answer, and and to you in your own opinion, I deviated. What do you do? You either ask me to reset, isn't it, or? Uh, you just fail me. Mm. That's it. Mm. But as we speak, we if you pick the white paper, the white paper actually put the what you call largely the 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 findings. The, the findings which to me very unfortunate because if you say they deviated, after all the commissioner the commissioners work we paid for it. Ghanaians we paid for it. Everything apart from probably the media. I don't know whether it was GTV. As for GTV, we pay for their work. But over here, you are private. But you were there. Mm -hmm. And so mine is that we paid for everything that took place. And so my expectations were that once you said they deviated, you would have to reconstitute the same team, give them your proper terms of reference, sit them in a room, take them through what you want them to do, so that when they come up with another recommendation, you look at how it will go. But they said, no, mm -hmm. they deviated and left it that way, mm -hmm. accepted just, I think, a percentage of it, 30 something percent of it. Areas that should have been accepted were not accepted. But I would say one of it that to me importantly was accepted had to do with the compensation, which to me was good. But one year on, have we learned any lesson? No, because mm. yesterday I was invited to speak at the commemorative uh, you know, event. And you can imagine, uh, I had a lot of people you know, uh, thinking, why should I be there? And you are thinking, are we that polarized? Mm. Because is it about a certain political party mm. or it is about victims right. who have suffered this brutality and atrocity? Is it about the ordinary Ghanaian or is it always about mm. the NDC, the MPP? But unfortunately, I think a time will come when we would have NDC painted water or branded water, <laughs> MPP branded water, and depending on where mm. you stand, maybe we might have to have the neutral uh, branded water. And to me, that is not very good. One year on, have we learned a lesson? I would say no. Mm. We rather have, sh we are sharply divided. Mm. And I say so because somewhere along the line, we had the Peace Council, uh, chaired by right, the good right. old professor here. They were doing a good job. And then I don't believe in 
just putting together legislative instruments and laws. You are a lawyer, you know. These things don't work if you don't have the ability to implement them. So I was thinking that par parliament or cabinet, instead of rushing through a certain, excuse me to say, a bogus, what do you call it, vigilantism and other offenses. So why do you call it law. bogus? Because since the day this thing was, you know, enacted into law, it has never been used. We have had DC is chased out of their office. Is that not an act of vigilantism? And the law has not applied. Okay? But those events happened before. No, 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 no. We've go had recent. Yes, I'm telling DCs you. Go being... and just Google. I'm sure your viewers are watching. Go Google and see how many sitting DC is today whose offices were locked by political party goons and tags who thought that the DC is not doing well. We have reported to the presidency and they are not sacking him. So we would love okay, it. After the passage and After law the passage. It is not one, it is not two. Okay. Several of them. Right. And so I'm saying that and when they started putting that thing together, I'm one of the persons that were invited to. Mm. And I said, I won't contribute because if the Peace Council is meeting the parties, at that time, the parties have softened their stand with most of them started distancing themselves from you know, vigilantism and all that, which to me was good. Then all of a sudden, an act was put together, became a law, and that law up to today hasn't worked. And so mine is that, where does that leave the Peace Council and their work? Okay. I would have wished that the, they would have allowed the Peace Council to do their work, come up with recommendations that would have fed into yeah. What do you call it? The the the, the, the law the itself. So that in moving well. forward, it would have helped them, but they didn't. Very and well. so for me, that's where I stand. Very well. I I think, um, Mr. Bonner, you raised a point that has been discussed on the show before, which is looking at the um, first the Justice Emil Short Commission's work and how that would impact the process of making you know the law of um, is it Act 999? Mm. I think we've discussed it at length, and in hindsight. It's coming back to us that perhaps we could have, you know, utilized the outcome or the output of the commission's work. Some have said that that was an opportunity that was lost. Reverend, what do you think about that? At the time when this bill was in Parliament being considered or deliberated, there was the argument that, hold on, if we really mean business, if we really are sincere about addressing the issue of vigilantism, and indeed, they had brought in other things about land guardism and all of that. If we really are genuine or sincere about that, then we would want to make the process very um, comprehensive so that the process which had been started, i.e., let's go into the issues to understand exactly what led to Ayawa so West Wogan. What are the recommendations? What are the sanctions? Let's see how that ends and then we can incorporate the recommendations there into this but that didn't happen and then of course there was the peace council national peace council's work which is currently ongoing that too was not to a large extent incorporated do you think was reverend that the vigilantism act was hurriedly um passed you see i'm not interested in talking about what is passed what do we do now? But that comes from no, no, wait, what we have wait. by way of law. Whatever the situation is, a law has been passed. Maybe the right things they could they could have waited and all that. But if I sit here and say they should have waited, that's that. Solve. That would be a lesson learned that, at no, least no, no, no. coming from you. That what, would be waiting. No, what are we doing now in respect of the situation that confronts us? Must be the concern now. Mm. Because this is election twenty, this is twenty twenty yes. election year. Yes. What must we do? Some have said that, that what happened at Ayawa yes. West was probably yes. the writing on the wall Dress in Heza. respect of exactly, exactly. <laughs> Dress Heza and so on. <laughs> so Mr. Bonai is saying that you know the laws that have been passed is not been effective, and I mean I I don't think that it's it's only at nine 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 that anybody will sit here to say it's not been effective laws in this country. We have majority of, it. majority of laws when it comes to implementation, sure. it becomes an issue. Because even 999, at 999, people said we don't even need that because exactly. there are already yeah. existing laws yeah. that so can deal with it. Let's talk about implementation. Let's talk about how do we really 
implement the laws that we put in place. Because you see, we can be academic, sit here, do analysis. That is not going to solve the problem that confronts us. Right. The problem is that the laws have been passed. Um, Emil Schultz Commission submitted their report. Government issued a white paper, which unfortunately a lot of people, and I mm -hmm. personally thought that the white paper shouldn't have had, you know, chucked off some of the things mm -hmm. that it did. The most but, important one. Yeah, well, but it did. Mm -hmm. So we accept the white paper and the recommendations that have been made. Are we implementing those recommendations that the white paper even said we should do? Mm. Most Rev, before we answer that question, I think really the, the thing has to do with the sincerity about this whole process that we, we want to really solve. And, 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 and if you would allow me, I think that is coming against the backdrop of first the content of the white paper. Mm. And then, of course, subsequently how we dealt with the, 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 the vigilantism Abra, and other, Abra, uh, other you, related offenses, you, offenses bill, which was passed into law. Here. <laughs> to talk. Yes. My concern will be, what do we do to solve problems? You know, the sincerity issue, it will be very difficult to judge somebody's sincerity. Why would the president get up and say that parliament should look into this? The two parties should talk and all that. Well, I assume that he was sincere in doing that. But the actions well, would also I help us I'll, determine I'll, whether I'll, they were sincere or not. And there are a number of, not there are number about, of things I can put not, out there for us to look at. The moment you do that, you throw a kind of, you know, you create a kind of situation that is going to bring us back here to talk. Let's find solutions to this. I'm saying the president set up a commission and Mr. Bona agrees with me that it was a very good thing. Very good one. Yes. The commission did a good thing. In fact, when it was set up, a lot of people didn't think they would deliver the goods. They did. More than. But, but Prof, no. I'm sorry to be cutting you, but the yes. question is, what good is the work of the commission, which has been acclaimed by the masses as being good, if the government that set it up says this about its findings? And let me read from page five. The fundamental response of government to the findings of the report is that the report failed to address the first and most critical of the terms of reference of the commission, which was, quote, to make a full, faithful, and impartial inquiry into the circumstances of and establish the facts leading to the events and associated violence that occurred during the by-election. It goes on to say the failure to do so disables government from accepting in whole the findings of the commission. So if they, ref if they are saying this, no, we, rejecting it... We, we've already said that it then is... Then the recommendation is coming We've already out. said yes. that it is unfortunate that a government, government's um, white paper would bastardize, mm -hmm. you know, uh, such an important work that has been done by a commission. But at the end of the day, the white paper also said that there are some aspects that must, you know, be implemented. One is the compensation issue. And flowing out of this Ayawasu Wogon thing is what Parliament has put in place. We didn't have, you know, people were saying that the laws were already there, but the laws, you were a lawyer yourself, were scattered. I attended a number of meetings where they were just dotted here and there. Now you pull them together. So at least you have, you know, a law that has brought together, that, that, that is comprehensive. comprehensive. That is good in itself. So my, my concern, dialogue is going on. Mm -hmm. Mike, and yet at the same time, on the ground, as he is saying, people are behaving as if there are no laws. People are behaving as if no efforts are being made. So what do we do mm -hmm. to address those kinds of issues? Very well. Doc, <laughs> <laughs> what do we do? I'm posing let me, let me most relevant uh, questions to you. What do we do? Yes. And we do things based on what we've done before. Mm. You don't fix it if it is not broken. Mm -hmm. I, I started by indicating that one year commemoration is a day of uh, more or less reflection. And the reflection that we saw is not one that smacks of confidence in terms of uh, never again, especially when it is situated within the context of certain things happening at the back of the door. I quite remember there was a time that when Obama came here, he said, 
Africans do need strong leaders. We need strong institutions. institutions. And by strong institutions, we need laws like what Mr. Bonner makes reference to. And if you come to Ghana, we have almost every law on the land, but it doesn't work. Why is it not working? And that is where I come to answer your question. Mm -hmm. There needs to be a paradigm shift. We need to do things differently. If it was done in a certain way before, and it did not work, it does not mean that we should do it the same way. Mm -hmm. That is why mm -hmm. I always say that 2016 was a wake-up call to us Ghanaians. It was a wake-up call because 2016 was a period that we never witnessed before in terms of what our political history within the fourth Republican dispensation, where a certain president is voted out with a difference of one million votes because people wanted to see something different. People wanted a total revolution. The way things were done under Cheroponi, under uh, what did they, we didn't want to see the same thing now. So if we all agreed that what happened at Ayawaso West Wogon was something that was not right, something needed to be done so that it never happens again. But when there seems to be a lack of commitment, there seems to be the same rehearsal, you did me, I will do you more. You get my point? If you listen to the, the statements that were being uh, uh, made at that commemoration, it doesn't show anything reconciliatory. There's no reconciliation. When you talk about let's do something differently, what, what are you expecting to see differently that you haven't no, seen? Not, the four of us have all agreed that what the Emil Short Commission did was a good job, mm -hmm. but how it was implemented, we are not all not happy about it. It's not the case. Reverend made reference to that. Mr. Bonham made reference to that. You what, would you, what would you want to see? Those, those who did the wrong thing, mm -hmm. if you do something wrong, you are either punished mm -hmm. or you show what? Remorsefulness. Mm -hmm. If I happen to have done something wrong to you and I'm being called and I say, Abna, I'm sorry, you have the option of forgiving me or making sure that I'm punished. Mm -hmm. But when you say that somebody did something because that person was under provocation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so <laughs> extreme provocation. Now, now you, gonna, right. It's worrying. Mm. Now you raised something about you know things being done differently and uh, so that we we ensure that they don't repeat themselves. That is it. Some have argued that well, it starts with, um, if you like, making examples of people, so that there's that level of deterrence in there. Of course. If that doesn't happen we won't get any results. And which is why in my intro, I raised the question whether or not the Justice and Most Short Commission has, be, has suffered the fate of many, many commissions of inquiry under the Fourth Republic, for instance, where, yes, they're set up, they do a good job, they put out good recommendations, but we see nothing happening. And then we go back, we never learn. I mean, you see, the reason why we are discussing Ayawaso is because we see Ayawaso as microcosm of what will happen exactly. probably in 2020. I doubt, God forbid, if Madame Emilia Alassane will pass on where we'll have another by-election. No. But we are having this discussion, especially looking at it one year ago, because we do not want to repeat such mm -hmm. what mistakes. And that is where, when you made reference to page 6 of the report, it says that what? It is a collective what? Responsibility. Responsibility. Where we make sure the dark areas of our democracy are not repeated. Right. So if we do not want the dark areas of our democracy to be repeated. There, there needs to be commitment in ensuring that that does not happen. Right. And my point <laughs> is that, from what I'm seeing, from what has transpired all this period, the white paper, the commemoration, it doesn't look as if we've learned any lesson. Okay. And it doesn't look as if we are even ready to ensure that that does not happen again. Very well. We need to take a break. But when we come back, we'll be going to look at the reports um, uh, particularly the portion where it talks about individual liabilities. It goes on to name certain persons who, in the Commission's perspective, should be sanctioned. And we'll take a look at government's response to those um, findings and recommendations by uh, the Commission. M Dr. Ahmed Janapo has indicated, you know, has preempted that aspect of our conversation where he talked about um, the defense of provocation being put out by government in response to, you know, questions as to. Um, what to be done about the person who was seen slapping the Honourable Member of Parliament, Mr. Sam George, in that video. Now, the beautiful thing about what happened in Ayawaso West Wogan constituency by-elections, 
Although unfortunate is that we all saw it happen. And so thanks to the media. Thanks to the media, <laughs> exactly. And technology, of course. And so we cannot be removed from the process. We are all a part of it. We saw it happen and post that we saw the sittings of the commission live on television. We also heard it live on radio. And so indeed we do know the intricacies of the things that happened on the day and indeed during the hearing. So when we come back, we'll turn our attention to the individual liabilities as put out by the commission and the government's response to these. Are we indeed serious about putting an end to election related violence? That is the question we're looking at on the show this morning. We will see you shortly. Welcome back. You're still watching and listening to The Key Points live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So we're looking at one year on um, after the uh, Ayawaso West Wogan constituency by election violence and the setting up of the Commission of Inquiry to look into the issues and make recommendations and all matters that happen thereafter. Uh, we're still looking at that. Have we learned any lessons? Is, have we demonstrated any sincere commitment to bring in an end or at least, you know, making an attempt to address election related violence? Now, we're moving on next to look at the individual liabilities that um, the commission spelt out in its report and the response by government. Now, before that, I would want to, for purposes of you know, situating this whole discussion within the right perspective, particularly this uh, next leg of the conversation we're going to have, I'm going to look at the terms of reference of the commission. Now, there were generally three, if you like, yeah. The first one was uh, to make a full, faithful and impartial inquiry into the circumstances of and establish the facts leading to the events and associated violence that occurred during the Ayawa so West Wogan by-election held on the 31st January 2019. Then two, identify any person responsible for or who has been involved in the events, as, uh, events associated violence or injuries. Three, inquire into any matter which commission considers incidental or reasonably related to the course of the events and the associated violence and injuries. And then lastly, uh, to submit within one month of its inauguration, its report to the president given reasons for its findings and recommendations, including appropriate sanctions, if any. Okay, so now, given this terms of reference, the commission set out to do its work. Now, on the first term, which is to make a, faith, a full, faithful and impartial inquiry into circumstances, the white paper said, well, uh, the commission ne didn't necessarily pass the test. So that's the, the first one. Then the commission, pursuant to its terms of reference, again, identified persons who should be held responsible, if you like. And so under its individual liabilities section, it goes on there and lists a number of persons who should, in their perspective or estimation, be dealt with. Um, there's a court talks about the, the commission recommends the criminal prosecution of Mr. Ernest Akumia, alias Double, for the authorized possession of firearms, for the unauthorized, sorry, possession of firearms under section 1921 of the Criminal Offenses Act. Then the second one is the commission recommends the criminal prosecution for the offense of assault to wit the slapping of Mr. Samuel George by Mohammed Suleimana. There's also the recommendation for the immediate removal of DSP Samuel Koju Azugu, who um, from command responsibility at the Ministry of National Security, given his failure to appropriately command and control the SWAT team of which he had charge during the operation at the La Baolishi School polling station. It is recommended that he should be reassigned by the IGP. Uh, the number of recommendations or um, individual liabilities are stated here will be going on along with that, like three or four more to go. But now we'll be looking at the first two, uh, which is looking at the recommended prosecution of Ernest Akomia, who is, who is otherwise known as Double, and then uh, the recommended criminal prosecution of Mohammed Suleimana. Now, let's take a listen or a look at government's response to that um, 
recommendation, particularly for Suleimana, because double the, 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 the government agreed that he should be prosecuted. Now, for the person who slapped Mr. Samuel Nati George, this is what the report, the white paper is saying. The government does not accept the commission's recommendation that Mohammed Suleimana must be prosecuted for the offense of assault, to wit, the slapping of the Honorable Member of Parliament, Mr. Samuel Nati George, on the basis that the commission at paragraphs 6.1 and 6.2 on page 55 of the report accepted the facts which led to the said assault on the Honorable Member of Parliament, Mr. Samuel Nati George, which facts support a valid defense of provocation for the said assault. So there you go. Um, the, the government rejecting that because they say that from the facts, there's a valid defense of provocation. And so the, uh, the, the recommendation for the prosecution of um, Suleimana is not accepted. Now, I mean, here's what I, I say on this as a lawyer, that it is a court of competent jurisdiction that would, you know, come to the conclusion that indeed, yes, whatever defense you put up is available to you. I don't think it is appropriate for anybody to, on their own, make such a conclusion, particularly when a commission of inquiry that has been set up to look into matters that led to the occurrence of something has actually put out its report and then we say that i think this raises serious serious issues about how sincere we are when it comes to resolving this matter and i think we should look at this now i will start with you here um, um mr adams Bonner, on this because we have we have agreed at this table that in any of these instances the issue of sanctions is key because that is the only way we can put out the issue of deterrence. Otherwise, it's just one thing after the other. There are no lessons learned. Nobody sees the need to refrain from certain acts which we have condemned. So this is where we are at. Yes, and so uh, the it's almost as if uh, the white paper supported the act of vandalism, the act of brutality, the act of, uh, you know, violence by way of uh, saying that the Honorable Member of Parliament deserved the slap. But you know, you are a lawyer. Um, we are told the President of the Republic is an astute lawyer, human rights uh, lawyer, defender of human rights, goes on. And the President does also have his chief legal uh, advisor. The Attorney General is also, we know, an astute lawyer. And so for probably this white paper to have actually accepted that it was okay when someone provokes you, you can dish out whatever uh, slaps if you, you can do it, and then probably go home and then nothing happens to you. For me, I find that very unfortunate. And it's a reason why one year on, we haven't learned any, any lesson, because then these persons who slapped the Honorable Member of Parliament, it doesn't matter whatever he did. I think that the presidency and those who came up with the white paper should have allowed this to go to court. After all, uh, slapping someone is, is an assault. And we all know that under our Criminal Offenses Act, if you slap someone, uh, you would be charged by the state for an assault. But then they... The white paper says, no, he shouldn't, I mean, the guy should not be prosecuted. And so if you are me, and 2020 elections are coming, and you, you are going in there, chances are that you are going to be prepared that if they slap you, you've got to slap back. Maybe if you receive one slap, you slap 10. And so mine is that it is, it is hypocritical on the part of the executive to have looked elsewhere and actually said that it was good for you know uh, the honorable member of parliament to be slapped because it was an ex he was you know he extremely provoked this man i mean who de who determines uh, you know as you know extreme provocation i think we should have allowed that for the court to determine after all is the reason why we say the court is independent isn't it okay. and so if you went in there and chances are that the the guy who slapped sam george the court said well uh, under uh, looking at the circumstances, uh, you know, there was nothing else the guy could have done that to slap you. Then we said, that is what 
the law, the court says. Mm -hmm. If some judge is not happy, he goes to the next level to appeal mm. the, the judgment. He can go up to the Supreme Court, isn't it? You are a lawyer. But unfortunately, the white paper says what? No, leave it that way. And so for me, that is where the fear emanates mm. from that. You see, uh, some level of impunity, you know, uh, have been allowed through the, you know, the white paper saying that, well, and so I don't know how 2020 is going to be if probably uh, mm. the presidency does not redraw. I don't know, you are a lawyer, you probably would have to educate me on this. If the white paper can be redrawn and maybe uh, we have probably a better and more satisfactory uh, white paper, but the white paper assistance at the moment has rather sharply divided this uh, country more than we expected. Very well. Let me move on to Doc. Doc, your, your, your perspective on, on, on the, this issue, the individual liabilities, <coughs> because clearly this commission was set up to look at issues and pair its terms of reference, identify persons who should be held responsible and give sanctions where they deem appropriate. In this case, they identified certain persons, recommended certain you know, movements from certain quarters and all of that. And in respect of others, Suleimana and um, Double, they recommended criminal prosecutions. They, so clearly that would have been taken up by the Attorney General, if indeed, you know, um, they had to. In fact, no, Suleimana, they didn't accept the prosecution. Yes. They recommended prosecution, sorry. I, I think Double, Double was, uh, it was one of the key architects and players when it comes to this whole thing. And as you rightly said, government did agree that he was supposed to be prosecuted. As to whether he's been prosecuted or not, no, he hasn't been prosecuted. That, you see, and that is where that is where we have a problem. Uh, <laughs> in this country, when something happens, we make a lot of noise about it and we go to bed. On the issue of Mohammed Suleimana, I think that uh, the response on that issue uh, that is justifying his action uh, by virtue of extreme provocation, I, I find that uh, untenable. But that is the position of government. As you said, uh, by your knowledge in the law, uh, such a decision needs to be determined in a competent court of jurisdiction. I would have wished that somebody should have challenged government's position in court. But uh, I don't know whether that has happened or not. But in all of this, Abna, uh, I have a saying that, look, when there's a fight, and you want to show that you are very strong if you are not careful by the time you realize the fight is over and you don't even get to fight i i i make reference to this mazam because you see you the one of the most important people in all of this when it comes to Mohammed Suleiman, is honorable sam george and you refer to him as honorable because of the position that he holds I am not in any way trying to justify what Mohamed Suleimana did. But sometimes when we have certain positions, we need to be very, very careful and mindful of our conduct. Of our conduct. When you look at the video that you guys have shown over and over, he went there being boisterous and, I mean, behaving in a manner that, in my estimation, is uncharacteristic of the office that he held or that he holds. Because look, like it or hate it, if a policeman stops me when I'm driving and he asks for my driver's license, whether what he's doing is right or wrong, in as much as he's in that uniform, I'm not, I have to give him what? The due respect. Recently, I understand there was an immigration officer who was driving with the husband and the police stopped her and it came up, all kinds of stuff. The woman, even though she's an immigration officer, was arrested. Fact of the matter is that once an officer of law is on duty, no matter what position you hold, you must respect the uniform. So when you go there daring them, challenging them, I think that is what informed the extreme provocation. Even though I'm not saying that it is right. You get the point. I'm not saying that it is right. So we need to be very, very careful. We are having this discussion because we are going into 2020. I don't believe in this position of intransigence and yen penne. No. Yen penne. You are talking about the state. You are not talking about individual. You are talking about what? The state. If the state says that this is what the law is, this is what you are supposed to do, 
you need to follow it, whether you are right or wrong. Recently, I found it very refreshing when I heard Mr. George saying that he's going to court to challenge one or two things. Mm -hmm. That is the right approach to use. Okay. You cannot use physical violence. You cannot use strength because the state is bigger than what? Every individual, including the president. So, this whole issue about Yem Pene, Tokosai, and no, it doesn't work. Mm. It doesn't work. So, I, 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 I believe that we, 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 we need to follow up to find out what is going on regarding these people who are supposed to be reprimanded. As you rightly said, Mr. Samuel Azoga is supposed to be sent, Azogo is supposed to be referred to the IGP and he's not supposed to hold any position of what? But that, that was rejected. That, that one too was yeah. It was rejected by, 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 by the white mm, paper. Then he was found to have acted according to the white paper. Acted that's what within, the, that's, yes. that's the white paper believes that what he did in mm. terms of supervising those boys on TV. Uh, it, well, that's, that's, that's the idea. But as I said, look, in these things, when, when you, are, you are in a certain position, you need to be very, very mm. careful and mindful of the law. Right. Don't fight the law. If you think the law is working against your interest, there are right channels to act. But, but is, it, is, it, is it not also because yes. uh, when, I mean, I in all this conversation, I really haven't also heard the right honorable speaker of parliament, uh, you know, speak directly to some of his uh, rogue members of parliament. Rogue members of when parliament. Them rogue, I call what them, did they do? Listen, you uh -huh. see them, not some of them, I'm not saying all of them. Uh -huh. We've seen some of them say, Me, I'll beat you. Mr. Ab you Mr. See? Mr. Mr. Bonner, <laughs> yes, please, we are on TV. Okay, uh, I'll redraw. Okay. That's fine. Uh, so let me, yes. I'll redraw. Okay. Let, let me, I'm, I'm, I'm just, what I'm, yes. I'm trying to uh -huh. add to what you said. What I'm trying to say is that, you see, we have a certain impunity that has crept into Ghanaians. Because we have learned from some of our leaders. You see, he was talking about a police officer. I have seen some members of parliament threaten to beat a police officer. And what did we see? Well, which is why we're having this kind of conversation. Ultimately, we hope things will change. As um, you know, has been said around the table already, we can't continue to do the same things and expect to get the, the results we yeah. want. Definitely, we have to change. Who was it that said that? Was it Einstein or something about doing something? You know, you need to change. We're well, doing the same thing. Exactly. Not exactly. I can't remember exactly. Results. We were one of the scientists. Yes, but, but most reverend. Yes. Um, we will need to quickly be wrapping up, but I would want us to look at, you know, the, the act and how it would deal with the issues. But also, before we move on to the act, the act of parliament, act 999, let's look at, you know, the individual liabilities that I raised okay. here. Yeah, I want to. Well, I think that. I would like to look at it in terms of responsibilities that you know people have you know it's it's said that you know privileges would imply responsibilities exactly. even if you have been given a gun okay that's that's because of the work that you're doing attached to that will be responsibility how to use it um, in public and all that and that's the reason why there are instructions as to how those who have been even give, giving guns, how they need to comport themselves yeah. in public. You don't say I've been given a gun, so I'm going about in public and just shooting around. Yeah. And therefore, the question of responsibility becomes very, very important. Again, if you are a security officer, you need to control your temper. Yeah. You don't just say I've been provoked and therefore, yeah. because I've been provoked, I'm going Pushing to act out. this way. You embarrass <laughs> the government yeah. when you do that. And I think it is important for us to note that those people truly embarrassed the government by sure. the way they acted. And coupled with that is the mask. You haven't even mentioned it. The I, the mosquito, the mosquito repellent. I, was, I was surprised that, you know, security people who are conducting their act should wear masks. Mm -hmm. Doesn't that presuppose something? Yeah. You know, I don't want people to see me. And that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. You know, um, we, we have to be very careful. That commando kind of attitude for just a very simple by-election by -election is not called for. Right. So as far as I'm concerned, it is unfortunate that the white paper would exonerate certain people. I would have thought that they would be brought before... The a court for yeah. the competent court of jurisdiction okay. to say that no they 
you are wrong and for people to challenge it. Right. I have always insisted that the rule of law demands that we truly make use of the laws of the land. People have every right to demonstrate if they think that they are not happy with what is happening. They, you, have, you don't have the right to destroy things. If you are not happy with something, you go to the courts. Right. And once the courts have spoken, you also must abide by the rules of the court. All these things are happening because we have no trust in our security system. We have no trust in the uh, you know, judicial system that we ourselves have put in place. And not until we begin to show respect to the institutions and the very laws we have enacted in this country, we will continue to take laws into our own hands, whether on the side of the security or parliamentarians or individuals, and do things that would, in the end, not help our country move forward. Right. So, so the issues here have to do with people not taking responsibilities, right. you know, um, they, they, in terms of the privileges that they have. You have the privilege. You are wearing something. Yeah. Somebody is giving you these kinds of things. Yeah. You should be respected. But you must, it is for that reason also that you must also comport yourself very well, right. that you don't embarrass Right. the government and right. the people of Ghana. Right. So in your estimation, you, you think on the prosecution, government should have resorted to the I, I, to, I, I not to I reject believe, that. I believe that once the commission recommended these individuals to be dealt with, that if they, anything, it should have been put before the courts mm. for the courts so, to go. So right. I mean that, yeah. so for the courts to, to make that determination. Mm. I, I said we we'll need to look at the act. But you see, there's another aspect of this whole discussion which is, came out strongly and which had to do with the recruitment of personnel into the national security. You remember, it became very clear from the hearings that um, personnel from very, the various or national security are recruited from you know, the, the political parties and all those issues came up. We talked about that. The white paper, however, says that the finding on the recruitment process of personnel into the national security is not supported by any evidence before the commission. At least for me, I heard some witnesses testify to that effect, that indeed there are some levels of recruitment which, you know, is, if you like, the, the, it's from the political parties. So political party foot soldiers or sympathizers find their way into national security. But we are being told that there was no evidence before the commission to support that fact. And so that finding itself was rejected. And I think it is key that we address this because over the years on this show, we've had calls to complain about the kinds of recruitment that are made into our security agencies, which brings about a certain perception of the security agencies that we have in our country, whether good or bad. So indeed, this is an issue that we also need to address. Dr. Jinapo, your Well, are you saying that that's the, the, the issue of people being recruited into the national security from uh, political parties was a conclusion that was arrived at by the uh, Oh, by yes, the commission. the commission did say that. So the commission arrived at that conclusion, the commission but the white paper rejected yes. it. Is that what it is? The commission finds rather disturbingly that yes. the national security establishment is the means by which party faithfuls of succeeding governments are resettled, and this has created a creeping politicization and deprofessionalization of the establishment. Yes, but this was rejected by the government. Exactly, that's what I'm well, saying. Well, yeah, I, I think uh, <laughs> it's, it's a known secret. Mm. At least, we, we live in this country. Uh, we know people that uh, we relate with who are with uh, political parties and when when the parties come into power they even get you i want to be national security and they don't even know what it is <laughs> they don't know what it is and i think there's evidence of uh, 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 is it I, I don't know the, the mpp has a terminology for this this boys uh, when they came into power you remember uh, no full soldiers. They, they have a term. Mm. Uh, the NDC N -P -P, is called the Hawks, right? Oh, you're talking uh, about the, is it the Invisible Forces? forces the yeah, the invi yeah. invi Invisible Forces. Right. Most of them, I mean, if you remember, they took over the Jubilee House when, when they came into power. You remember the security man at uh, Dashanti Regional Security Coordinator? It's, it's a known secret, and it is not characteristic of this government. Exactly. Alone. It's something that has been happening over and over uh, the years, I think the recommendation by the commission 
is something that should have been adhered to. In the sense that when you go to most of these advanced countries, even they have uh, professional ambassadors. Like we have people who are career, 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 diplomat. career diplomats. Yeah. Their national security is the same thing. Maybe a few people will be changed, but there are people who are career national security what? experts. Such that whether there's a change of government or not, they stay in office and their training takes a very long time. But the truth of the matter is that in this part of the world, when governments are changed, immediately these boys whose responsibilities before they join the national security differ from what the national security does. Because these are macho men who, I mean, what they are known for is brutalizing people, beating people up, and protecting their, their, their candidates and all those things. So when they get into the national the game, the, 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 the game plan changes. Here you need to be professional. You cannot hit just like that. I don't know what government has done in that respect, even though it's rejected that uh, recommendation. It says there's no evidence before the was, commission. Yeah, I understand. But I think that uh, government really would have to have taken it seriously. Mm. Even if you are recruiting your boys into the national, they need some more training. Mm. They need some serious training in terms of how to handle guns, how to even uh, crowd control, and how to even police, uh, I mean, dignitaries and people uh, and stuff like that. But I, I doubt if, if this will change immediately. Mm. Because as we speak, the opposition also have boys who are also... But that's uh, the point. Yeah. But if we are not, if we're refusing to see it as a problem, then it means we're not even no, thinking of I, resolving I, I, it. I, 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 my, understanding, my understanding of the government's white paper on that issue is that there's no evidence, evidence before to show before the commission. There's a difference between saying that it is not true and there's a difference between saying but that... What, 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 but before what, the commission, what, what are we evidence, saying that? What evidence would the government want? Dobbo went there and said he had three weeks of national security training. Yes. And they took him to uh, where? Is it uh, where the military training... Bon Jassi. Uh, bon Jassi. Uh, but yes, to yes. give him, okay. you know, to teach mm -hmm. him how to handle, gun and stuff handle like you okay. know, for three weeks. Yes. You don't become a national security officer by May doing three weeks. By what, what, what standard? What standard are you using? Who is saying that you don't become a national no, what I'm trying, well, no, no, no. What I'm trying to say is that if you, and in the commission, mm -hmm. they ask them, how did you get in? Yes. They said, I used to be a polling, sure. uh, whatever. Yes. And so what I'm trying to say is that if you have to recruit someone into the national security, mm -hmm. anyone who knows the rigorous, even with the police and the rest, mm -hmm. sometimes these processes to get in takes quite a long time. Mm -hmm. He, in, in his own submission, he actually, you know, told the whole world how, how, how he got in. Yes. And so the evidence was there. So, so Mr. Bonner, the point I'm making here is this. There's a difference between recruiting somebody not through the right channel or not getting the proper training mm -hmm. and the person being a party member who is being recruited. The question that needs to be asked, is double qualified to be recruited into national security? You see, is a minute, minute, minute. Is it qualified right. by, yeah, by, by, by the assessment of those who do the recruitment? Mm. If they say the standard is, look, you can come into national security if even you have never been to what? Secondary school. You've never been to JSS. The basis for admitting you is that, look, you are loyal, you are this and that and that. You go in. Training is for one week. That's what it is. Yeah. No, I, but, no, but that's no, what no. they're saying. Training is not So there's a difference so between let, 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 let them not having reference. enough training. What the white, what, what the, uh, the, the commission. Uh, commission is saying is that uh, uh, what, what the government the commission made a finding that, that the, issue the national of security is the means by which party faithful force are recruited, are resettled, exactly. are resettled, exactly. and government is saying that there's no evidence, evidence to that. before the commission. I think I think it is important for us to in looking at this matter say that we know in this country whether it's perception or whatever it is that our security services seem to be 
there is politicization of our security mm -hmm. services. NDC police, MPP police. And it goes back before mm -hmm. the NDC mm -hmm. MPP. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you know the history of this country. Look, I was a young pioneer mm. in Nkrumah's time. And um, I can tell you that people were being recruited on the basis of their party cards. Cuts. From then, we have not been able to address that kind of mm -hmm. issue. So what they are saying now should have been something that you know, we will take on board and say, what do we do, do to exactly. create professional security? Exactly. Right. Career in other security. words, in other words, most reverend, you're saying yes. that if indeed there was no such evidence before the commission, yes. we do know. We do know that yeah. it is a fact. We indeed, all talk we've about heard that. Yeah. In fact, political when political figures make these see, statements, yeah. our political parties are very interesting. When you are in opposition, you're your language different is different. Yep. When you are in government, <laughs> yes, your language is different. We can go back, Google back and see statements that were made. Sure. We all agree sure. that we are politicizing our security services. And that is not it will, it no, it's, it's not, a not, it's not good. It's not going to work. It's, it's not, not going to help us. Right. And therefore, there is something that we need to do about that. Whether sure. there is white paper or not, I think it is important that we look into that kind of situation. If we really want to handle our security situation in this country carefully, mm. let's address that. Sure, very well. We, we need to be wrapping up, but in, in wrapping up, most Reverend, I'd want to hear from you. you. You talked about the fact that there's an upcoming meeting on the 4th of February, which um, is going to look at yeah. you just, you know, enlightening us on that. No, I have, I have said that we have met with mm -hmm. the political parties and, and not just the two political parties, but also other civil society sure. organizations. I can mention all of them. And we have come up with um, a document, a roadmap and a code of conduct okay. that would help us because the political parties have signed a communique or you know disavowing yeah you know that the the political category of vigilante mm. political vigilantes mm. violent vigilantes are not things for us to support and we have brought together experts who have put all these things together we would bring the two political parties to sign the sure. document and then we, it, it doesn't mean that once we've signed, we finish our mm. work. It will mean that we will have responsibilities. We will meet with the security services. There are a number of people that, uh, institutions and other groups that we will be meeting to try to help so that the, 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 Vigilantism and no, the, the, the position, you know, why the commission was set. Right. You know, to ensure that everybody comes in to contribute towards the, the peace of the sure. country by dealing with this sure. that collective that collective thing right, right. Will, will come up Very well. so that's what we are doing and it's on the fourth the fourth golden tulip um i think there we will need all the press and other people to sure. get there we, we will, will we will, will be there we'll, we'll show the we'll document be there. but before i move to the, um, the, 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 the your co panelists for their concluding remarks if you could just tell us so what is the state currently of those Vigilantes, vigilante groups, because they, they, I think it's outlawed. It's outlawed, so they've been disbanded. It's outlawed yeah. by the laws of the yes. by yes. by by on paper. Act nine nine nine. I it like is that on paper. Outlawed. Yeah. So if anybody does anything in, in that name, that person is breaking the law. Right. Did the, you get anything in an, an undertaking, for instance, from the parties that yes, they are going to see to it that all these affiliates? Listen, of you them, don't need an not, undertaking from no. a party to say that a law of no, this land must be kept. I, I do respect that. But and I'm, just, I'm saying that they, are co they have committed themselves sure. to ensuring that they are saying that they will not encourage that. They will not have it. Very well. You know, so we, we have that yes. commitment um, stated. Very well. Um, Mr. Bonner, your conclusion remarks on this well, way my, my, For me, I, I think that In the, a way, minute. Forward, the mm -hmm. way forward would be for the executive to take the recommendations as it was submitted and probably uh, see how it can be implemented if we really want to fa fight any act of vigilantism you know, in this country or else. It's going to be, I don't envy uh, the good old professor uh, with us here. Uh, his work is, they, they make it very <laughs> difficult because then uh, in one breath, you know, names are mentioned. And so for me, I think that uh, the, the executive should help the Peace Council in doing their work and I work somehow with the Peace Council mm. and I'll tell you that they are they don't also have the resources okay. mm. they have several districts they, they don't have offices they mm. are vehicles I think just about one or two mm. and I'm just thinking that how do you put a Peace Council and start you know starve them when it comes to resources to move right I hear they are not even paid 
And so you don't expect them to do any good the job. The National if Peace Council has an advocate <laughs> speaking for yeah, so yeah. That's great. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> now, Doc, your well, your think, uh, on this. Uh, this whole discussion started with uh, what happened last year. I was West Wogo. And clearly, uh, there seems to be unanimity on the part of the general public that we don't want it again. Yep. Mm. Uh, this being an election year, I believe that uh, the various players, especially the two major political parties and the other uh, stakeholders like Peace Council mm -hmm. and those civil society organizations, need to be really committed to having a, a peaceful, free and fair elections. Right. I believe that Ghanaians will be more than happy and will accept any election that we have if they deem it to be free, fair, and peaceful. At the end of the day, we've done this before. We've done this a number of times. Mm. <laughs> there sure. are times that people never even thought that we will get where we are. Mm. It's always like that, but we always have to take it seriously. We don't want a violent election. We want a peaceful, free and fair well. election. That's what we need. Very well. Thank you for that. On that note, we bring the conversation on this part of the show to an end when we looked at one year after the 31st January uh, 2019 by-elections of uh, at the Ayawaso West Wogan constituency. We've had this discussion with Dr. Ahmed Jinapo and also most Reverend Professor Emmanuel Asante. He's the um, chairperson of the National Peace Council and Mr. Adam Spona. We'll take a break. When we come back, we turn our attention to voter registration matters. Stick and stay with us. We'll be back. Thank you so much. Thank you. Most Reverend. Thank you. Welcome back. You're still watching and listening to The Key Points. We're live on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So moving on, we're going to be looking at matters around the um, EC's decision to compile a new voters register and also to acquire a new biometric voter um, management system. Um, with me in the studio to have this conversation still, we have Dr. Ahmed Jinapo uh, from the University of Education, one of our senior lecturer at that university. Next is uh, Mr. Kofi Adams. He's the former national organizer of the National Democratic Congress, NDC, and currently the aspiring member of parliament for the Boehm constituency. And to my right, we have Dr. Ali Duseidu. He's a senior lecturer at the University of Ghana Political Science Department. Um, let me add that we extended an invitation to the New Patriotic Party NPP to send a representative, but unfortunately we don't have one present at the moment. Just in case they show up, we'll do the needful and introduce them accordingly. Good morning, gentlemen. Welcome to the show. It's great to have you here as usual. Um, so uh, this part of the conversation we are looking at, as I indicated, voter registration matters. And uh, this week, particularly Thursday, the 30th of January 2020, the much anticipated meeting uh, between the Electoral Commission, the Electoral Commission's eminent advisory committee and IPAC took place. And uh, going into this meeting, we had, the, from the benefit of the show last Saturday, we had spoken to the uh, Director of Election Services, or is the Director of Elections at the EC, in the person of Dr. Sribo Kweku, who had indicated that uh, that meeting, scheduled for the 30th of January uh, 2020, was essentially to inform stakeholders why the EC had taken the decision it had taken, which was to acquire for the nation a new biometric voter management system. And we had asked the question then, what essentially was the essence of the meeting that was coming up? Because uh, the understanding, or at least what people were expecting, was that they were going to engage the stakeholders further, you know, on the way forward. So the meeting did come off on Thursday and of course parties involved maintained their entrenched positions. Question is, which way are we moving? And what becomes of the positions, you know, held onto by the various players in this space? We'll take a listen to a report put um, together in respect of this matter and then we will return to the studio to have the panelists. Um, put out their perspectives on this. Let's take a listen to the report. Um, committee of Eminent Persons afforded opportunity for all political parties 
to be heard. They made a presentation. There was only one snack. As far as you are concerned about the procedure. Independent uh, presidential candidate of a previous election, who in our opinion did not have any status as far as IPAC is concerned, was allowed to make a presentation. While civil society organizations, which have always played a very important role in our electoral reform, were denied opportunity to make a presentation. That one, we think, uh, uh, is, is, is very irregular. The Commission did their presentation, both technical and financial presentation. At the end of the day, what has come to light is that none of the issues that were raised spoke against the data of the Electoral Commission. So as far as we are concerned, all the other things that the Electoral Commission want to do can be done without compiling a new data. Because we ask the Electoral Commission technical person whether the data is credible or not credible. And you could not tell us that the data is not credible because the Electoral Commission has conducted elections with this data as, as late as uh, December last year. And for that matter, we believe that all the other things that they want to do can be done without necessarily going back to touch the data through a new registration. Leader of the All People's Congress, APC, Hassan Ayarga, insisted the parties against the voters' register will continue with these demonstrations. We we'll go on the floor. Why are you doing that? You because because I, I, we didn't have a proper reason. You cannot. You have to convince people that yes, of course, the new voter register is not credible. Right. The national chairman of the People's National Convention, Bernard Mona, says the EC's timing for the processes leading to the elections is dangerous. If you tell people that your register will be compiled and available on the 8th of November and you are a participant in elections, what it means is that you are taking more than enough risk because 8th November to 7th December is just one month. So if there is any hitch, what are you going to do? Deputy Minister for Local Government and Rural Development, Obi Amwan, disagrees. Then the CI says that Within 21 days of completing the exercise, the parties will have the register. Now, we are going to make sure that they comply with what is in the CI. We are not going to say that they can give us any date. We want to make sure that the date they will give us complies with what is in the register, uh, in the CI. Are we okay with that? Communication director of the NPP, Boabian Samoa, said the NPP has always maintained this position. At this point in time, as if it's about a number of political parties not wanting the register, which is the impression that which is the impression that the NDC has created. That the NDC and the coalition of political parties do not want the register. If that is the question we are answering, that today the question has been answered effectively and affirmatively, yes for a new register because 10 political parties said they wanted a new register. According to the 2016 independent presidential candidate Joseph Oseyabua, the aim of the opposition parties is to cause trouble. Well, so those were scenes from uh, the Coconut Grove Hotel where, uh, which was the venue of the meeting between the EC, the EC's eminent um, advisory committee and IPAC. And you, you heard from the national chairman of the NDC, uh, Mr. Samuel Fuswampov. Also, you heard from the general secretary of the party, um, Mr. Johnson Sedum Ketia. There was also Mr. Bernard Mona, national chairman of the PNC, uh, communications director of the NPP, Ms. Honorable Yabwa Bia Samoa, and, and many others. Obviously, of course, there was also Mr. Obi Amwa. Um, obviously, it's a total um, <laughs> situation of confusion, or not confusion, disagreement, sorry. Clearly different positions, no headway in terms of consensus. Question is, how do we proceed from this point on? But before I go to the panel, I think uh, I need to put out this issue here. Um, uh, last week on the show, we had with us um, Sheikh um, Arim Yao Shaibu, who came onto the show as representing Kodeo. He was here in the person or in his capacity as acting chairperson or acting vice chairperson, sorry, 
of the Coalition of Domestic Election Observers, Codeo, co-chairperson, sorry, of, of Codeo, and he made some statements which has been um, misrepresented to a large extent and it's been published widely. We do want to correct that, you know, misrepresentation. He was speaking to the issue about the way forward given the stalemate that is currently between the EC and uh, the parties opposing or opposed to the EC's decision to acquire a new biometric voter management system and uh, to compile a new voters register. He said he would think that you know it, the, the political parties opposing would be better off you know mobilizing their supporters to actually participate rather than continue with their um, demonstrations given the clear stand that the ec had taken he never said that the demonstrations being undertaken by the inter party resistance against the voter, the new voter register, um, those demonstrations are useless. Indeed, he's been quoted as saying that, and I'm saying categorically that he did not say that. Never once did he say or describe the demonstrations as, as being useless. He did acknowledge that they had the right to do that, but he said, given the position of the Electoral Commission, he thinks as a piece of advice, he would encourage the opposing parties to mobilize their supporters. And so please, that misrepresentation going on out there should be stopped. He never said that. And that is what we think we need to do as the platform on which he made that statement. He came here representing Kodeo and not as the spokesperson of the chief imam. And that is also being um, put out wrongly. He was not here representing the chief imam as his spokesperson. He was here as the co-vice chair, acting co-vice chairperson of the Kodeo. And so I think we should take note of that and, uh, you know, put a stop to that misrepresentation that is going on out there. But again, once again, gen um, gentlemen, welcome to the show. And it's good to have you. I believe I'm you were here. Do do you see, in this Doctor, case, Jeff, you're here. When, when, when people are in a certain manner, if you are not careful, statements that you make will be attributable to you. In fact, I was here. He never said that. He never, he never said that. Way. But when he's introduced us, co-chair of Kodeo mm -hmm. and spokesperson to the chief imam. He wasn't introduced as such. No. Never once did, did no. I mention no. that he was no. coming no. or no. that no. they no. have no. it no. there. He, he didn't. Has, has Kodeo so. changed his position about engagement? Because Kodeo itself has a position. Official that position. Official but position was that they have, stated, they have stated clearly. So it means even on that, he will be speaking yeah. in his own capacity, yeah. just yeah. like the way uh, Mr. Ahin did. On, 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 on a particular platform because Codeo has a position mm -hmm. that it has stated clearly that there's a need for engagement. Mm -hmm. So for you as an acting vice chair to be advising that suspend every demonstration and request for engagement or suspend and prepare your people to go and register. It's as if now you are shifting the position. But the misrepresentation of here is not even coming from the Codeo. Uh, it's not to say that that's a differing view from his position as mm -hmm. against that. They are saying that he said, you know, they should seize and that he was coming as because of the would definitely yes, get that there, was, there was publication that was done by yeah. various uh, exactly. uh, uh, or, news, or news outlets yeah. that put the image of the chief imam. And you know what the optics does. But that, that when it clearly comes to is mischievous then. When, when clearly it comes is to mischievous. When, you know who did the publication? Clearly is mischievous. You know who did the publication? I, I don't need to know who did that, but I'm <laughs> saying to the extent that he didn't say that, I'll understand. I'm telling you, if you see who did the publication, I'll understand. you careful the way you talk. <laughs> am I am I no, speaking on truth? No, the, the, what I'm saying is that the first publication that came mm -hmm. on that was three yeah. news. Well, I haven't. I am being told that Check. it has been misrepresented. No, it's, by I know. Media they'll skip. They'll so skip it just that, to that, that. That 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 is right. So well, let's move on to <laughs> <laughs> the matter that brought us here. Of course, it's a continuation of what we had last week. Which yeah. So. Mr. Adams, you yes. were in the meeting. No, I wasn't. You in were the not, meeting. but okay. Yeah, but at least I've received briefings from the meeting, right. uh, from various uh, courtesies from my own political party and other party leaders that were were present. Mm. And I've been a regular person at IPAC for sure. a very long time until recently. Sure. So happenings there, I have a way of getting mm. getting to know what's what, what's happening. Okay. And the, a few developments post the meeting. I believe that needs to be corrected because uh, the meeting was actually called 
by the eminent advisory uh, committee of the electoral commission and so it wasn't a meeting called by the electoral commission but you would realize that post the meeting it is the electoral commission that is communicating to the country about outcome of that meeting mm -hmm. when the meeting actually agreed on a statement there was a draft statement that they all agreed to that was to be issued and so the expectation was that the eminent advisory committee would be the one to be putting out that statement and not the electoral commission which is also presenting its part of of the story and i believe that people are not too happy about that and was there, was there a communique at yeah, the end there was and a that communique, communique agreed, was put out was agreed that it would be put out the draft statement was agreed okay and among others was to get the technical teams of the various political parties to engage the technical team of uh, the electoral commission mm -hmm. and also to continue dialogue mm. because the the eminent advisory committee realized out of the deliberation that there is a need for some further mm -hmm. engagement and they will be considering all the propositions right. in their advice right. to the to the electoral commission so are you saying Only that that statement that statement has not come out okay so it's, it's out it's, it's, it's out, out now. When? Okay. Since when? I, I'll, I'll forward it to you. Right? Very well. Because so the, one, the one that came out was the one signed by the communication uh, 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 director of the electoral... On behalf uh, of the eminent... That's what it says. Okay. Mm. You, you, you send it to me and let's, let's see if we could quickly verify and, that. But and, before... before and and the, the worst part is that if that was the case, then that is not the statement sure. that was agreed. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's not the draft. Yeah. That's not the draft. Let's, that's let's have that and then put a judgment to it first. But going into that meeting... What were your expectations? And I'm asking this because on Saturday, like I indicated, we were lucky enough to speak to um, Dr. Srubo Kweko, yeah, yeah. who had indicated clearly that the Thursday meeting was for them to inform the stakeholders the why, as it were, justify the decision they had taken. Going into the meeting where you were, oh, no, no, you didn't even go in I didn't personally, go but of course, the, your party yeah. went. Your party, when it went into the meeting, did it go into that meeting with that understanding, or there was a different understanding that you had? Not at all. If that was the understanding, okay. then we, we wouldn't have gone into that meeting. The understanding was that this was a situation where the eminent persons who are supposed to, who the Electoral Commission is self composed without maybe any consultation with whatever parties that have been involved with them, IPAC and what have you, mm -hmm. they compose them to advise them mm -hmm. because they know they will be going into a situation that demands advice. Mm -hmm. They saw the need to call that meeting. Mm -hmm. And if you look at the agenda of the meeting, the Electoral Commission was to do their presentation, then political parties present will also do their presentation, mm -hmm. I think 10 minutes each, then follow up questions and discussions and of course conclusions there, thereafter right if it was just for them to go tell as what it is that they have decided and that is final then there was no need for presentation from political parties many of whom are, are disagreeing which was exactly the position we i mean i had when yeah. i was yeah. so, so, last so week. so it's clearly okay. one thing that institutions must take note of is that when they have communication units mm -hmm. they must allow certain presentation to be done by the communication unit. Right. Sometimes the person you are speaking to, yes, he hates election services. So for, for him, as far as he's concerned, he's finished his work, this is what he thinks must happen. Mm -hmm. But in communicating that out, especially in relation to a meeting that has been called to deliberate, I believe that they should have left it for the communication unit to, 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 be, do, to, that. Be, to do that, to be put in so that this kind of presentation that we have decided, it is just a mere meeting to tell you what we have mm -hmm. decided and that is what is going to happen. And that is what is actually creating problems problem right. more for, for right. even the eminent, right. eminent person. Sure. So indeed, there's this uh, statement that was released. It's headed for immediate release January 30, 2020, and it's titled uh, The Eminent Advisory Committee, Electoral Commission and Inter-Party Advisory Committee Dialogue. It talks about the meeting process, observations from the meeting, and it, it, it goes on to talk about going forward. It says, after the meeting, the eminent advisory committee noted that apart from information being shared among the parties, an opportunity for further dialogue was created. From the above, and in accordance with the role of the eminent advisory committee in promoting good governance, uh, the eminent advisory committee shall, going forward, A, 
uh, take feedback from the meeting on board in offering its advice to the EC on the subject. And two, the EC will invite the technical teams from the various political parties to meet with its IT team. So this is what you're saying. So going forward, they still have further engagements to do. And then the EC is to invite the technical teams from the various political parties to meet with the IT team. If, right. if you read earlier, you would observe that certain things have been put there that the inter-party uh, uh, committee mm -hmm. are against the new register have mm -hmm. equally issued a statement mm -hmm. just yesterday. Mm -hmm complaining about this very statement that you are talking about mm -hmm. that that was not what was agreed at the meeting and that mm -hmm. is the uh, uh, the draft statement that they all agreed to to be issued certain vital parts were actually left out of that statement and they have also issued an expecting the advisory uh, uh, committee to as a matter of agency put out the what the understanding that right. they had at that meeting. Right. So meaning that even the statement... That in itself, there's, there's, a, there's an issue. <laughs> Doc, the sta I mean, one disagreement after the other. Clearly, the, this is a statement that has been issued. We see it on the letterhead of the EC. It's signed by um, Mrs. Sylvia Anno. He's a, she's the acting director of public affairs. We're hearing from Mr. Kofi Adams here that this is not the statement that was agreed to be put out clearly raising further um, issues here. Well, what would you make of all of this that is happening? I think uh, one of the most important things we need to look at in this circumstance is the issue of transparency. See, there is so much suspicion and mistrust between key stakeholders to the electoral process. Those who are against the register, those in favor of a new register, and the EC in between. I, I, I think they have all taken entrenched positions, but their positions are informed by fear, but also mistrust. You know, mistrust and suspicion in the sense of what? Previous experiences in their dealing with the EC, or could also be informed by poor communication or lack of information. So I think in circumstances like this, the suspicion will deepen. The suspicion is also informed by a certain level of fear and interest. What is the interest? The, the EC thinks, maybe what the EC says in public is that it is their responsibility to conduct free, fair, transparent elections. So their fear is that if we do not do a new register, we will not be able to achieve this. That is what they say in public. There may be other interests that motivate them that we don't know. Mm. They may not state in public. The political parties are afraid that the, the calendar, this electoral calendar, year calendar is too loaded. New voter register is not necessary. The data, everything is good. Why, we've used this register to conduct a lot of elections. Why do we need to change it for the 2020 elections? And that is what they state in public. They mention finance, they mention time bound, they mention a lot of things. But there are also interests that they will not tell us. And the interest is winning elections. So if they believe that a new voter register may not inure to their benefit in the 2020 elections, they may not clearly state that, but they will point to other important reasons why we shouldn't have a new voter register. So in the midst of this chaos, the EC, which is the overarching body, should be very transparent and should not engage in actions that may deepen the suspicion of political parties. Now, if they you believe... Do you think the EC is doing that? Yeah, if, if, if people think that the EC is not forthcoming with enough information about what is needed. I, the EC has done its part. Right? They have issued a lot of statements, the reasons why they need a voter register. But the political parties, not all of them, those who are against the voter register, are still not convinced. Mm -hmm. So they say they have posed a lot of questions and demand a lot of explanation from the EC, which has not been provided. Now, after these processes that is aimed at what? Bridging the information gap, then these complaints still begin to, to, to emerge. That, coming out that, that, this, that this wasn't what was agreed. Yeah. Then if it is true that this wasn't what was agreed, who, who was? took what out? Yeah. And what is the interest of that person? Or is it just that the inter-party... Uh, resistance against, resistance against is also playing mischief. Mm. We don't know. But I think in the midst of this, we still have to deepen dialogue. It is, it is very, very, very important. Mm. And, and largely speaking, we need to assume a more holistic view to this process, to be honest with you. Is the new voter register a roadblock or is it a speed ramp? 
in the run up to the 2020 elections. If it is a roadblock, it means it is completely closed. Without a new voter register, we can have a credible elections in 2020. Mm. I don't see it that way, honestly speaking. Personally, I think it is a speed run. When driving and you get to a speed run, you definitely have to slow down. Why do you slow down? One, you want to maintain your vehicle in a good shape. But two, you are also looking at the impact of the people who will be affected by when you overspeed. So I, I think if you have used this register even up to just last year, December, and everything has been credible, I will humbly appeal that we can appease to both factions. We need adequate time. Technology keeps evolving. And once we begin to use technology in our elections, we need to be very careful. Mm. So I think we can still hold this year's election without the new register. Then after the register, we take our time and be able to compile a register that will stand the test of time, that will address all these challenges, mm. and we didn't rush it through. Mm. Because now, the, the, the if information we are getting is that the process will start from uh, April to May, and then political parties will get the register on the 10th of uh, November. The 8th of November. 8th, 8th of November. Mm. Election is 7th December. Mm. There will the definitely money. be complaints. There will definitely be issues. Right. So what time do we get to address this? So mm. in an attempt to, to solve a problem, we end up creating more problems. Mm. So why don't we take our time and compile a register that can stand the test of time, address all the challenges that the EC has found with this current register, and then both parties will win. Right. Okay. Uh, Dr. Jampo, at this point, the EC clearly is set to go. Set a date, uh, 18th April 2020, as when to commence voter registration. Do you think there's any scope at all for what <laughs> Dr. Ali do, said was suggesting that let's, you know, hold on. Well, I think uh, do things uh, later on. I mean, uh, we've, we've discussed this issue so many times and I'm very, very careful when I'm speaking to it because the issue is so polarized and so toxic. You know what is going on with Sheikh Arami? I mean, when you say we should postpone it, you are deemed as NDC. <laughs> when you say new voters register, you are deemed as NPP. So it's it's a very so the civil society groups to our NDC. No, but that's how they are classified. About 16, no, 18, were they invited almost, yesterday? They were not made to <laughs> do a presentation. Why? Why not? Uh, so, but that's that's the letter. So, that's the question that. So it goes to it goes to validate the the argument that I'm making that if you take a position against uh, a new voters register, you are attacked in a certain way. You get the point. If you want the old one, you are seen in a certain so way. So take a position for. What do you think is correct? That's what I'm going to speak and, to it. Careless and careless. I think I think, I, I, I think you should have made. Uh, no, 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 you have no, made. No. You have made. If you are not to sit at the other. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I think we are speaking to this issue because there was a meeting that went on somewhere yesterday. Was it the day before yesterday? Thirtieth. The thirtieth. Yeah, and uh, this meeting that went on, before the meeting, people were optimistic that mm -hmm. something good was going to come out of it. And I believe that informed the inter-party resistance uh, against the new voters register to even put on hold right. some of their uh, plan sure. actions. Uh, unfortunately, and that's for me, unfortunately, there was an announcement by the Electoral Commission that the whole process was going to start on the 18th. I would have wished that they would have held on till the meeting just to give some kind of briefing space for that whole I mean, engagement. Uh, engagement to take place. It looks as if, and it goes back to what you said, it looks as if both parties have taken entrenched positions. That's what it looks at. Please, yes. let's, let's pause, pause there. We'll take a break. When we uh, come back, we would continue with that. And um, when we come back, we'll also address another issue of misrepresentation that is coming to my attention. <laughs> now so we will take it uh, we'll take we will address that when we come back this is the key point stick and stay with us we'll be back welcome back uh this is still the key points and uh, live on tv three also live on 3 92.7 and online at 3news.com also on our facebook page tv3 ghana so currently we're looking at uh, the meeting that came off on thursday the 30th uh january 2020 um, between the Electoral Commission, the Electoral Commission's Eminent Advisory Committee, and the Inter-Party Advisory Committee, IPAC, uh, which was, you know, among other things, uh, looking at the EC's decision to 
uh, compile a new voters register and also to acquire a new biometric voter management system. The meeting ended, you know, in, in, in an inconclusive manner. Uh, parties maintaining their positions, which as of now can be best described as entrenched positions. Uh, question then is, uh, how do we proceed? Uh, EC has set the date of 18th April 2020 as the date for the commencement of voter registration exercise, clearly raising issues about uh, the inter-party resistance against the new voters registers position on, um, you know, their opposition to the EC's decision. Question is, what would this um, um, intended further engagements yield? Is there any scope for the EC to rescind its decision at all? Or what exactly is the way forward? And this is what we are grappling with on the show uh, this morning. Before the break, Dr. Major is making his submissions. I'll go quickly to him for him to uh, conclude with his submissions. Yeah. No, I think uh, before we went on break, what I was saying was that we thought there was a window of opportunity for the 30th of January meeting. But uh, as you rightly pointed out, it looks as if uh, we are still in a stalemate. Nothing conclusive seems to have emerged out of uh, this meeting. I don't think we can continue this way because I'm reliably informed, and I think it's even in the public domain, that the inter-resistance uh, in the inter-party inter is going to have a demonstration on the 24th, uh, 24th. On, on Tuesday, yeah. on the 4th, and that is not even going to be the end. There are a number of them that is going to continue until the EC listens to them. When I listen to the EC, it looks as if the EC is not ready to buy. And if you remember last week on the same platform, I said that it looks as if we are going for a showdown. The eminent <coughs> advisory committee has a responsibility of advising the electoral commission. They've had the opportunity of meeting the electoral commission. They've had the opportunity of meeting IPAC. And I believe they've done a lot of consultation with other stakeholders. What is their position? I think it is important for the eminent advisory committee, based on the consultations and the meetings that they've had, they should state their position. Do they support a new register or not? And I believe that if they take such a position, it will help one way or the other in informing the, 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 the kind of disagreement that yeah. exists between these two main these two main parties. Because if you remember, Abna, when government wanted to, uh, was it uh, uh, this thing that National of Chiefs came? Uh, this the elections, referendum. The referendum on the elections. Yeah. When National of Chiefs came in, when they stated their position, even though that position was a position that was debated among them, that position informed government's withdrawal of that proposal because it was not accepted mm -hmm. by the people. Because National of Chiefs represent a lot of people in this whole country. So I want to hear the position of the eminent advisory committee. It looks as if they are just, uh, excuse me to say, playing some kind of delay tactics. And we have a very short period. We are in January, February. Today is 1st February. Tomorrow, uh, we are heading towards April. I think finality needs to be brought to this issue. And I would really wish that this whole issue of very important people who have an important say in this issue sitting on the fence uh, should stop. Finality has to be brought to this issue. Right. I understand the committee, the, 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 part, the, the, the group has petitioned former President John Kufo, they've petitioned uh, President Rawlings. I doubt if any of these two individuals, they are, they are whatever they say, will carry any weight because they belong to different political parties. But these are eminent advisory committee. Advisory committee advises electoral commission. What kind of advice are they giving them, especially on this issue? They right. can't. They can't keep on being mediator. Their job is to advise, so they should bring the advice out for us to know what position they are. Yeah. But you see, what, isn't it what? interesting? Sorry, to, sorry, Mr. Um, Kofi um, Adams, quickly on on what you said. Isn't it interesting though? I think we discussed yes. it last week that the fact that the eminent um, advisory Advice committee yes. had actually recommended this meeting. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, the EC had gone ahead to set a date. That in <coughs> itself that speaks is, volumes. That is where I started by saying that. When the eminent committee called for a meeting, it reduced the tension because at least there was an opportunity all, yeah. for dialogue to, what, to take yeah. place. And I, as I indicated, I found it quite unfortunate 
for the EC to exacerbate the tension at that time by announcing it did because mm. after all they were calling off the bluff mm. of the, the the resistance group or whatever it, it falls within their their mandate to do that but if something positive had emerged out of the 30th January meeting where finality would have been brought to this issue we are moving forward with what this voters registration all uh, sundry are on board let's look at how we can make it perfect mm. in terms of the processes of what registering what you need to register i mean how long will it and all those kind right. of things but here is the case we are back to square one mm -hmm. so i'm asking the eminent advisory committee their mandate is to advise technically they are not a mediating body mm -hmm. their mandate is to advise the electoral commission what advice have they given the electoral commission on this issue yeah, well. and what informed that advice and i think if that advice is made public it will persuade most people who are on the sidelines mm. to what to take a side. Right. Okay. We'll we'll we'll, we'll get to that, Mr. Kofi. I'm sorry. Coming to you next, but again, let me put out here. I think before the break, I indicated that when we come back, I'll address a misrepresentation <coughs> that is also making the rounds along the lines of uh, um, Sheikh Arimi um, Al Shaibu. Last week, Mr. Vitus Azim was also on the show. Mr. Vitus Azim is a former executive director of the Ghana Integrity Initiative, GII, and he also made a statement regarding um, the way forward on the voters registration, sorry, the voters register compilation. He has also been mis misrepresented. He has been stated as saying that uh, the demonstrations organized by the inter-party resistance against the new voters register um, are useless or needless. Indeed, he also didn't say that. And I, I, I would want to plead with, you know, uh, um, 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 the, you know, reporters that are making or putting out these publications to be circumspect in, in the reportage. At least let's capture the statements as, you know, put out by the people we are saying set them. In fact, I've had cause to see uh, one of the publications where it is in quotes, or, you know, in quotation marks, that this is what the person said. And that is, I mean, for kind of like, that is just unpardonable, that you quote somebody as saying something which they didn't say. I think we should, you know, um, um, refrain from doing that. I Mr. Bajos Azim never said the demonstrations were needless. I'm putting that on record. He never said that. And we are trying to get the, the video to play that. Yeah, Sheikh right. Arim Yao Shaibu also never described the, the, the demonstrations by the inter-party uh, resistance against the voters, the new voters register, as needless or useless. Please, let's get that straight. They never did that. And so uh, I think that would bring some, you know, clarity or finality to this whole controversy. Never once did they say that on the show. Right? Thanks for that. Mr. Adams. You see, I've not really had opportunity to speak on this matter, on this platform and my colleagues maybe have had. So mm -hmm. that explains why they are moving to the next uh, level. But then what is the Electoral Commission seeking to resolve by this new register? That the current register cannot help resolve. What has been the processes that we have always used in constructing a new register? And when have we done so? I've heard arguments that the current voter register has uh, uh, about 17 million plus and that there's a possibility of persons who have died and who are still in there. But meanwhile, in printing their election material, they have to print what is in the register plus a certain additional percentage of between 5 and 10 percent. And so it means that money will be wasted in terms of printing more than needed election material, that is, uh, ballot papers. But again, if you are going to construct a new register and you have not waited for the census report to come out, you must rely on the new register, the data as we have it now, in printing your material. Because, for example, if I am in OT region, and Buim constituency. And my register currently has, say, 50,000 people on it. And you want to come and construct a new register. I would not accept printing material less than 50,000. And the material used in registering is more bulkier than a ballot paper that you will be printed. So which one will cost more, actually? 
because to register an individual you have to use about two or three sheets that will cost more per person than just a single ballot paper so if only you have waited for the census and the census give indication that this is the percentage of adults who are Ghanaians, 18 and above. So if you are printing material for registration, you will not print up to what the register have. Then you'll be talking about savings. So that argument falls flat. I have also heard argument that the current register cannot remove dead persons. Dead persons cannot be removed by register. Dead persons are removed upon a report by the relation of the dead person or if there's a way to connect the okay, electoral commission system with maybe register of uh, uh, death and, 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 and death so that immediately that happens the uh, voter information of the person is captured and the name is moved to deletion deletion that is what will remove and not any software or sorry not any machine not a new BVD machine, not a new BVR machine. And to make matters worse, you remember the first statement that the chair of the Electoral Commission made, which I thought was unfortunate. Her first argument against the, uh, those kids was that the container looked like a village uh, married uh, uh, portmanteau. <laughs> so her worry was about even the container that was, <laughs> that was containing the kids. That was her first statement. And again, in the course of all this discussion, you would realize that the first person that announced the 18th April start of registration was not the easy. It was the interview granted by the General Secretary of the ruling party on a program in Asempa. Long before the EC put out that date, there was no IPAC meeting. They have not communicated, at least to the NDC as far as I know, about the intent of when they want to start it. So how did the General Secretary of the ruling party know of the start date and was announcing it on air ahead of the electoral commission so for electoral commission to come and tell us the exact date that the general secretary of the ruling party mentioned on that means that there's something uh, uh, that goes on that we are also at unaware then of course i've heard some say that uh, uh, the technology of the the bvr machines is that in some way they say it's one gig, uh, and then another place they'll tell you it is, uh, 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 they want to advance it to a higher, a higher capacity. I use iPhones, the, at least not the very latest, but quite advanced. I have another phone, a very old model. When I go to my constituency, all these fancy new phones, they don't function. It is that old one that you can't get your, Three, three and four G's on. The one that is model for the two G's and the rest, that's what is functioning there. That works effectively. <coughs> the election machines are not only for areas with advanced, uh, the, where you have the four G's and then the, the three G's and what have you. You are conducting elections in every part of the country. I've also heard arguments that they have more than 260 districts. And the machines as present is only 200. Electoral Commission have never done registration in all districts at the same time. And currently, they are telling us even if they want to do the register, they are going to do it over a 40 day period of 10 days each in an area. Meaning that they are not going to do in more than maybe 80 or 90 districts at the same time. So 200 uh, 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 machines is enough for them to go ahead with whatever additional numbers that they want to have. Sorry, especially. You, you need to wrap up for me. We need to take especially, a break. We're especially. Especially. Yeah. My question is yes. But I mean, just, all those arguments have been made, that notwithstanding, the EC the, says. That is why we are going all of on. us. So, what is the way forward for? The way forward is for all of us to let, to let the EC know mm -hmm. that. Yes, it's true that in terms of their work, they are independent. Mm -hmm. But it is true that your independence does not mean that you can just get up and do anything that you feel you want to do. Mm -hmm. In this case, that common sense and what had happened in the past shows that after the 2000 census, we constructed a new register. 
manual which we use up to 2012 uh, up to up to around 2012 when we constructed a new one again after the 2010 census it will make much more sense that even if we want to construct a new register to wait for the census that is going to happen this year the report will come out then based on that very evidently statistical report we will work on the new well. register especially oh, no, no, especially especially when the electoral commission attempted to do limited registration they told that they were going to register just about 500 uh, thousand people because that's what they estimated to register we told them that was wrong okay. based on the statistical service okay. data well, they ended up registering about 1.2 1.3 million people thank you so, clearly we, we should we, we should be worried about the electoral commission right yeah, yeah, i think you, you've made your point we'll take a break when we come back uh we will wrap up on the conversation here this is the key point uh we will be back when when we come back i'll also take some messages that have come through from our viewers and listeners. See you after this break. Welcome back. Uh, this is still the Key Points Alive on TV3, also live on 3FM 92.7 and online at 3news.com, also on our Facebook page, TV3 Ghana. So this is the last lap indeed we've run out of time, but we'll try to, you know, um, get the concluding remarks of the panelists uh, pretty soon and wrap up on the show. Um, let me come to you, Dr. Ali, to say it quickly. Uh, this also would be a concluding remarks. We've run out of time, so clearly there's a still mix. Uh, what do we do to get out of the woods? I, I still think we need more engagement, more board-based consultation, and then more compromise and consensus building. Once building parties take entrenched positions, they have interests and they have fears. Let's explore the interests and the fears of these two entrenched positions and see how we can navigate around it so that we can build a consensus. I think they are all doing this to make Ghana great. So if we have a denominator, common denominator of making Ghana great, we can build dialogue based on that denominator and then we'll move forward. Right. And you think that's feasible? Okay. Yeah. If, 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 if our main aim, as we state every day, is to make this country great, then I think it's the basis on which we have to reduce tension mm. and then do things that will make this country great. Unless there are other <coughs> interests that we do not state. Mm. Very well. Um, Mr. Mr. Adams, uh, in, in a minute. Clearly, uh, the Electoral Commission is not doing what we expect from it. We expect the Electoral Commission to be able to just as they did recently with over 7,000 elections of assembly members and over 30,000 unit <laughs> a more complex election your architecture supported it you were able to do it now you are advancing arguments that it is not possible to conduct an election that involves just 275 uh, uh, constituency and uh, one ticket at the presidential level. You have done 7,000 electoral areas and 33,000 unit committees. It was possible. You were able to do everything and you got as results. It is possible to do the same with this, mm. with this data. And Very they well. should stop the arguments that Very they well. have. Dr. Jinapo, I'll give you 30 seconds. Uh, well, I, mean, I think uh, the way things looks, looks as if uh, the Electoral Commission is bent on getting us a new register. I'm interested in seeing how and what modalities are going to be put in place such that nobody is disenfranchised. I think it's as simple as that. Every Ghanaian wants to vote. Mm. And every Ghanaian should be given the opportunity to vote. Right. Okay. So let me take some uh, quick messages here and then we, 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 we call it a wrap here. Um, good morning, Madam and your panel. I sincerely agree with Mr. Lidu that the Electoral Commission should try and listen to all those political parties who, oppose, uh, who are opposed to this new register for the sake of peace. Ghana card and this population census will give us different figures. And if that happens, we are going uh, for a new register in 2024. That's Majid in he says mami kobo as he's done learn what says the current law doesn't support what the current ec led by jane mensa is trying very hard to do the chairperson should be circumspect with the dealing which shouldn't be whimsical nor capricious ghana is beyond electoral violence therefore the right thing must be done irrespective of who appointed you that's aziz donla um this one coming in from asanko in santa maria says is it legal safe or morally right for card bearing members of a political party to occupy leadership positions of the electoral commission um you see in banana in says if npp should force a new voters register we are likely to have a serious uh, serious chaos during the registration or during the elections i think we should maintain the 
current one and go for a new one after the elections. The peace of this country now lies solely in the hands of the EC. Um, Simon from Tepa says, I honestly think we don't need a new register now. At least the EC should maintain the current register for this year. It was that same register we used in the just ended D, um, district level elections. I think the EC has an agenda or they might have been instigated to do so. Otherwise, they should hold on at least for this year. And that's Simon in Tepa. We've run out of time, so I, I have to pull the brakes on the messages here. But also to say a big thank you to our viewers and our listeners for making a date with us, for sharing your um, thoughts with us as well. We do appreciate that. But also thank you to my panelists um, who have been Dr. Ahmed Janapo, Senior Lecturer, University of Education, Winneba. Um, Mr. Kofi Adams, he's a former national organizer of the new, I'm um, sorry, National Democratic Congress, NDC, and a current, the aspiring member of parliament for Buem constituency. And last but not least, Dr. Ali Dusedu, <coughs> a senior lecturer at the Political Science Department, University of Ghana. I would say thank you so much. We'll be back same time, um, same place next week. Do have yourselves a very good weekend. Bye-bye.